Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the word. As we find ourselves in the book of Romans chapter 1. If you turn your Bibles with, uh, with me to Romans chapter 1. This morning we're just going to be going over two verses in Romans. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the wonderful music. I want to thank uh, many of you also for your prayers for my cousin, Anthony. Uh, by God's grace, he spared his life, and uh, we want to continually, continually pray for him. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 reads this way. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is a power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, we are just so grateful for your precious word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every heart and thank you for the joy of just being able to gather together and hear your word proclaimed. I just thank you for this privilege, this joy. I ask, oh Father, that you would feed and nourish and strengthen and bless and convict according to um, your word and that your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work and prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. We ask now for your grace upon us. We ask your blessing. We pray, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. As you know, we've been reading through the book of Romans. We just started and, and Paul himself uh, had never uh, visited the church in, in, in Rome, though his heart's desire was to go there and to preach the word. And as you know, this church had already been established, many believe, through the Jews who heard the word preached by Peter during the time of Pentecost. And so by the time that the book of Romans is written, around the mid to late 50s, we learn that the church had already been existing for over 20 years. And so it is an established church, and uh, we learn that they are a church that is on fire, that loves the Lord, so Paul gives us credentials at the very beginning and shares with them that he himself has been called by Christ and been sent by Christ. He's been set apart for the gospel of God. And he begins to also share with us how Jesus himself came in the flesh, God Almighty in the flesh, the descendant of David, and has been declared the Son of God through power by the resurrection. So Paul begins to share with the Romans, introducing himself, though he knows a lot of families and individuals, he is introducing himself and his calling as an apostle to the nations, to the Gentiles. We learn that Paul also shares with them that he's always praying for them. Remember this last week? Go with me to chapter 1, verse 8. He says, first he says, let me tell you guys, he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. So here you have an apostle of Christ praying for them. And he says, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And so this church is on fire. They're moving forward. They have a bright testimony for the Lord. And then Paul says that, that it has been his desire to, to be with them. But Paul's been busy, hasn't he? He's been busy planting churches in Mesa, Macedonia and in, uh, in Asia Minor. And so he says, I long to be there and to see you and to impart a spiritual gift. Mainly, he wanted to go and share the gospel. But I want you to see something here before we get into the text in verses 16 to 17. That you see in verse 13 that Paul is in a way defending or in a sense explaining why he has been delayed first of all we know he's been busy and even now he's in Corinth writing this letter to the Roman church as he is on his way to Jerusalem to um, bring the gift given by the churches to the church the, the poor in Jerusalem and so we see here in verse 13 
I want you to see this, that Paul, in a sense, is giving an explanation for his delay. Okay? And uh, what we see is, in a sense, we almost see that he's defending himself. He says in verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation. In other words, Paul is under orders, isn't he? He's been set apart very specifically for the gospel to the Gentiles. And so he says, I am under obligation to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so that for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So Paul not only has been given the gift of evangelism, of a church planter, it is his heart's desire. He serves God from the deepest part of him, from his, uh, from his spirit. Now what's interesting is when you start in verse 16, that Paul makes a very interesting statement. And what is that statement? The very first clause you see in verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, which I thought was interesting. Why is Paul saying that? In a sense, it seems like Paul is defending himself. As you know, there's always critics and those who are against Paul. And maybe they're saying the reason why Paul is not coming out here is because maybe he's afraid. Maybe he's ashamed. So Paul is saying, that's not it, buddy. Paul himself is under Christ's mandate. Christ is not a, afraid, or rather he's eager. And he's been delayed because of He's been involved in the business of Christ. And so he's, he's making, in a sense, a defense, isn't he? For him to say this, this is a very strong statement. And so you see here the perspective. If you have your outlines, please take that out of your bulletins. You have in verse 16, the first part, Paul's perspective. And the second part, in verses 16, the second part of 16, and the first part of 17, you see that Paul describes the gospel as the power of God. And finally, in, in verse 17, in the last part, Paul begins to talk about practice. Uh, Mike, I think you need to lower this a little bit, would you? I, I can project my voice pretty good. And so we see here the perspective. And Paul says... In verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's a very strong statement. Paul is saying, look, what my delay to you was not because I'm ashamed or I'm being shy or timid. Rather, he says, I've been delayed. It's, it's been God's providence. And Paul has been waiting on God's timing to be in the center of God's will. And that's when he's going to make it out to Rome. And it has nothing to do with him uh, de delaying his, his visit with them because of other issues. And so Paul makes it very clear. In fact, we see here then that um, it hasn't been out of fear or shame, but out of divine providence. And it it's God's timing that Paul is waiting for. And so we see that in a sense, Paul is answering his accusers and critics regarding his delay. And so we learn that the scripture is very clear when it comes to Christ. Go with me to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 18. We are not to be ashamed. In fact, that was one of the areas he had to encourage Timothy, wasn't it? Timothy was a man that was very timid. And Paul had to tell him, Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of Christ. But rather be willing to suffer. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Beloved, we have to understand that when it comes to being a disciple of Christ and being a Christian, we have to be willing to stand for Christ. 
unashamed and speak for him. You know, the Lord has, he, he does not want cowardice among his people. He wants people who are willing to stand and to speak for him and be willing to suffer the consequences. Luke chapter 9, verse 18, what does it say there? Luke chapter 9, verse 18. It says, and it happened that while Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him and he questioned them. Remember this? He questioned them saying, who do people say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist and others say Elijah, but others, one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, and you guys remember this, this is, this is Peter's great confession, right? And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And uh, of course, we, we learn it's elaborated. We see it in, in the book of Matthew. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 21, and he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone. Remember, because Israel had the wrong idea of the Messiah, of the Christ. Now, I want you to hone in what he is about to say. Okay, and now they, they do believe he's the Christ, he's the Messiah, he's the son of David, he's the king of Israel. And, he's, and it says in verse 22, saying the son of man, verse 21, I'm sorry. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell, them, tell this to anyone, saying the son of man must what? must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. I bet when Jesus said this to his disciples, you could hear a pin drop. They're like, what? This doesn't fall into our plans. Our plans are glory and the kingdom. But Jesus is talking about suffering. They did, not, they did not understand that Christ came as the Lamb of God. They didn't fully comprehend that yet. So he's telling them ahead of time that he's going to suffer, that he's going to be killed, that he's going to rise the third day. And now look at verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, and that's what these disciples are doing, right? They're following Christ. They're, they're coming after him. He must what? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So now Christ just talked about suffering and he's telling now his disciples, you need to follow me. If it means suffering, then you need to be willing to suffer. Verse 24, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Now verse 26 is very important. For whoever is what? Ashamed of me. See that? The gospel is all about Christ, isn't it? And so Jesus is now saying, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words. I thought that was interesting. Not just of Christ, but even the teachings of Christ. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes into his glory. And the glory of the Father and of the Holy One, Holy Angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And of course, he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration when they'll see him in his glory. So what is Christ saying? He is saying, look, if you're my disciple, if you're going to follow me, you can't live a life where you're ashamed of me. You can't be some type of, you know, secret agent Christian. Well, you're not telling other people that you're a Christian, that, you're, that you're, you love the Lord. That's not the way to live the Christian life. That's not the way to make your light shine before men. Right? So Christ is saying, look, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. And so it's amazing that Paul makes it clear to the church in Rome. He says, when it comes to the gospel, guys, you got it wrong. My critics have it wrong. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In fact, I, I'm eager to go and to share the gospel with you. 
I've been delayed because I've been busy for Christ. So whatever you're hearing, it's wrong. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so, beloved, you and I, we cannot be ashamed. You are a Christian, and you are a child of God. Are you ashamed to be an American? I'm not. Are you ashamed to be a Christian? You shouldn't be. You're a child of God. You need to speak. You need to stand. We can't cower. And so living and speaking boldly for Christ is expected from a true disciple. Do you understand that? Living and speaking boldly for Christ is what expected from true Christians. And guess what? That's how Paul lived. Paul not only preached the word, but he lived a life of boldness, didn't he? Look at chapter 12. Stay there in Luke chapter 12, verse 4. We're not to be afraid, but we are to confess Christ. If we are to fear anything, fear the Lord. I love what David says. What can man do to me? What is the worst thing that a man can do to you? Kill you. Okay. I'm going to be with the Lord. So it's a win-win for me. I remember hearing from, uh, I think it was my, my grandfather, he talked about a man that was preaching on the pulpit. It might have been J. Vernon McGee. can't remember where I heard it from. It might have been J. Vernon McGee. Where he, this man was preaching the gospel and a man came up to him and he told him, you keep preaching like that, I'm going to blow your brains out. And the preacher looked at him and said, you can't threaten me with heaven. I'm not afraid of heaven. Isn't that true? You're going to send me to heaven? Fantastic. It's not a threat. And if your name is written in heaven, no one can take that promise away from you. And so, what is that man going to say? What's the, that's the worst they can do. Luke chapter 12, look at verse 4. Jesus says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I warn you, uh, to, uh, I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear the Lord. Verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Verse 8. I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. Now, you know what people say? Well, Pastor, I'm afraid if I confess Jesus, I might lose my job. Then, friend, you don't need that job. Or if I confess Jesus to my family, they're not going to talk to me anymore. They're going to Then, you know what? That's a consequence. You need to confess Christ to your family. You need to confess Christ where you work. You need to confess Christ. You are a child of God. And if you're afraid of the consequences, then, you know, there's something wrong. You can't be ashamed. Because that's who you are. And so Jesus makes it very clear. In verse 8, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him before the angels of God. Verse 9, but he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So it's so important that we understand that Christ calls us to confess our, our love, our faith in Christ before men. And if you feel like you're in the position that you're, you, um, you can't do that, then maybe you shouldn't be there, right? So you need to confess Christ. You need to be light and you need to be salt where you are. Go back with me to Ma Matthew chapter 5. Isn't that what Jesus meant to be light and salt? I think it does. Matthew chapter 5, remember this? Verse 10, after the Beatitudes, 
So he's talking to uh, not only the disciples, but many of those who are there at this, um, as he's doing this Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about what a true Christian looks like. And then, after he talks about what a true Christian looks like, they're blessed, right? Those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are gentle, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So in Matthew 5, I apologize for that. Um, after Jesus begins to describe what a true Christian looks like, then he starts in verse 10. He continues with the Beatitudes, and he says to them, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Isn't that amazing? Right after, he's just describing what a true believer looks like, one who is poor in spirit, one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, you know, they will be satisfied, one who is merciful and so forth. Everything is so beautiful. Then he says, by the way, when you stand for Christ and live for Christ, there's going to be some type of persecution. And so he says in verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. These are not secret agent Christians. These are people who are speaking boldly for Christ, living for Christ, living according to their convictions of the word and filled with the Holy Spirit. These are people who are letting their light shine before men, right? That's why they're being persecuted. Jesus says in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I'll tell you this, when you're going through persecution and people are, are, are falsely accusing you of stuff, your heart does not feel like rejoicing. But many times you're, you feel greed, but you have to understand this is part and parcel of living for Christ and speaking for Christ boldly. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it where? Under a basket. Can you imagine that? Getting a, a, a flashlight and then suddenly just covering it up? Why do you even have that? right? That's who you are. If you're, if you're light and you're salt, remember what salt does, right? This is before refrigeration. What salt does is it stops the decay. And they would put that in their meat and it would help the meat not to rot. It, you know, it helps with the, uh, the decomposition. And then, of course, light is to see in darkness. Verse 15, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, here's a command here. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, that's not being ashamed. Being ashamed is you're hiding the lamp and you're not being salt. That means you're not standing and living for Christ and you're not speaking for Christ. And so, beloved, you have to understand Christ calls us not to be ashamed, but to confess him before others. So let me ask you, are you afraid to confess Christ before your family, before your friends, before your co-workers? You need to ask God to give you boldness. You know, even Paul asked for boldness. Are you afraid to let your light shine? Sometimes we're a little intimidated, aren't we? But you know what? We still need to do it. We, we need to ask God to give us that boldness. And that many times we, we say, well, you know, if I do that, they're not going to want me to visit them anymore. Or they're not going to want me to, you know, to, uh, they're not going to, they're going to ostracize me from all these other things. You know, friend, you still have to live for Christ. Now, I'm not saying to be obnoxious, okay? I'm not saying to be um, mean. But just be willing to confess Christ. 
and speak gently, lovingly, but you have to stand for Christ. And uh, even if it costs you. Remember what he says to Timothy, go with me to 2 Timothy. Remember we just talked about him. Paul tells Timothy at this time, Paul himself is in 2 Timothy. Paul's in his last days in 2 Timothy. And what does he say to Timothy? He tells Timothy, Timothy, you need to be bold. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. He says to Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of what? Or cowardice. That's another way of putting it. God has not given us a spirit of cowardice, right? But of power and love and discipline, or another translation, of sound judgment. Therefore, he tells Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So you see what happens when you are light and you are salt and you confess Christ and you live a life of boldness and you, you confess Christ. There could be some suffering involved. And it might begin with your own family members. It might begin with your friends and your co-workers. Verse 9, He who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, he says, I also suffer these things, for I, and there it is again, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, just like the song. And I am convinced that he, the Lord, is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. You see, beloved, being a Christian is not simply... Yes, it's trusting Christ as Savior and Lord, believing that Jesus Christ, God's divine Son, came and He suffered and He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and He rose again. And yes, it's confessing Christ. In fact, the Bible says that in the book of Romans, right? That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. But now, how shall we live? Or to also confess Christ publicly and to others. And we are to live a life of righteousness. So they're to see our good works as well. So let's not be afraid. And so Paul is saying to the Romans there, I'm not ashamed. You know, whatever has been said of him, he's telling them up front, look, it's not shame that's held me back. It's been God's providence. And so we go back with me to Romans 1. And he says in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And here's the reason why. It is a power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, because they're the ones that first had the gospel. In fact, the disciples of Jesus were Jewish men, weren't they? And also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God, uh, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. So what is Paul saying? First of all, Paul is making a contrast. I don't know if you realize that. So he says in verse 16, first of all, he's not ashamed, and that's not the reason he's been delayed. He actually is eager and ready to preach the gospel, and he wants to bear fruit. He wants people to get saved. And he's willing to suffer the consequences for it. And then he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for what? For salvation as opposed to what? As opposed to the law. You have to understand the day and age that Paul is writing this. There were many Jews, though the majority of the church were made up of Gentiles, but the Jews believed that that when you kept the law of Moses, that somehow the law was a power of God unto salvation. And Paul saying, oh, no, no, no. 
It is the gospel message of Christ. Because salvation is by God's grace alone, faith alone in Christ alone, not by the works of men. And so he's sharing the contrast here. It is the power of God specifically when it comes to salvation. You have to understand that the, the, the mindset of the Jewish men, if you remember in John chapter 3, remember the very first question. In fact, Jesus answered it before it was given. The main question of every Jewish man was, how can I make it into the kingdom of God? And so Paul answers that. It's through the gospel. It's through Christ alone. And so he says, it is a power of God for salvation. And of course, there's a word dunamis, right? We get the word dynamite. So the gospel is a message of Christ, of him crucified, buried, and resurrected through the message of the gospel. As it is received by faith, men are being declared righteous. Sinful men, by God's grace through faith, are justified when they put their trust in Christ alone. This is opposed uh, the very opposite, the antithesis of those who are trusting in the law. That's exactly what Paul said. Remember what Paul said in the book of Philippians? Go with me there. Paul actually believed that his righteousness was in keeping of the law. Remember that, his little testimony he gives? In chapter 3 of Philippians, remember that? Paul says, if anybody had any confidence in the flesh, it was me. I was the chief, right? I was a Pharisee. He says, look at verse 4, Philippians 3, 4. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, and that was Paul before, this is B.C., right? Before Christ. Before Paul knew Christ, he believed that he was a righteous man because he kept the law uh, meticulously. He believed he was going to heaven. And guess what? He was on his way to hell because he didn't know the Lord. And his faith was not in Christ, but in himself and believing that through the law he'll be saved. Beloved, through the law, no flesh will be justified, right? And so we see here then, Paul says, although I, my, I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, he says, I far more. And he gives us testimony, doesn't he? Starting with his birth, right? Starting with his circumcision. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. He made it to the upper echelons of righteous men, right? I mean, to be a Pharisee, you had to have your doctor's degree, like in Old Testament or something. You know what I mean? And, and here he is accepted by, the, by the, uh, the cream of the crop. I was a Pharisee. Look at verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. At least that's what he thought. Not in God's eyes. In God's eyes, all this, these righteous works of Paul were what? They were as filthy rags. Paul didn't realize that until he met Christ. Look at verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me of those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. And we believe Paul lost everything. He lost his position. They believe he lost all his possessions. They believe he lost everything, maybe even um, family members. They believe at one time Paul was married. And we, don't, it, we just don't know what he means by loss, but it was a loss. Verse 8, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of what? Of knowing Christ. Of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which this is false religion, isn't it? 
not having a righteousness of my own, which nobody has, by the way, not in God's eyes, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul can't wait until he's resurrected. But he's saying, look, I had it all. And it, it sounds like what Luke said, right? What will, it, what will it profit a man if he gained the whole world? Paul, in a sense, had gained everything, right? He had money. Because trust me, those guys had money. He had status. He had everything. Everybody looked up to him, right? He had education. Everything. But then when he met Christ, he realized he really didn't have anything. Christ is everything, right? There's that old saying, if you meet me and forget about me, you lost nothing. But if you meet Jesus and you forget him, you lost everything. Jesus needs to be everything to you. Everything. And so we learn here that, that Paul, go back with me to Romans, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. First of all, when it comes to salvation, that is the power of God, not man's works. And so we see here then that, and, and well, let me just ask you very clearly, what is the gospel? You know, you hear that all the time. I remember raising my kids, and as you know, my kids are homeschooled. My wife was the one that really, she was the one that really took that, that burden upon herself. And I remember sitting down with my kids, and we're having our little Bible study. And, and I remember, uh, again, J. Vernon McGee says, don't ever take it for granted that your children are saved. I thought that was an interesting statement. And so I remember my kids were very small, and I said, okay, kids, I want you to tell me what the gospel is. If someone asks you that, can you tell them what the gospel is? Can you tell them what the gospel is? And so... I remember a friend um, of mine that uh, was asking someone from church, and he thought, well, wow, you're talking about the gospel of Matthew or Mark, and look, he didn't know what the gospel was. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians 15, okay? Because I want you to know what the gospel is. What is the gospel? And you need to know this and even memorize these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll start in verse 1. What is the gospel? What is this power of God? What is it we need to share with others? Well, Paul makes it very clear, and I'm so grateful. As you know, the Corinthian church at that time was preaching some false Judaizers had gone into the church and were teaching that there was no resurrection. And Paul says, look, if there's no resurrection, then you're, what you're saying is Jesus has not been resurrected from the dead. Therefore, you know, we're still in our sin. If Christ is not resurrected, we are to be the most pitied. Then we're preaching false doctrine. You see the importance of the resurrection. But listen to what Paul says regarding the gospel. What is the gospel? We know what it means. It actually means good news, right? It means good news. And what is the good news? Paul says in chapter 15, verse 1, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you also stand. But he says, verse 2, By which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ what? That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So the first part of the gospel is a sacrificial substitutionary death of Christ, the Lamb of God, who has come and has died for sinners. So first of all, he says, this is what I told you first, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and then what? And that he was buried, and that he was raised from, uh, 
It was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. What is this? That's the gospel. That's the gospel of Christ. It's a substitutionary death of Christ. Jesus, God Almighty in the flesh, came uh, in, in human flesh. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He came. He lived a perfect, holy life because He's God. And He dies a sacrificial death, right? Uh, in the hands of sinful men. He dies for sinners, a substitutionary death. He was buried, and on the third day, He rose again. And now... By our trusting in Christ as our Savior, as our Lord, if we believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, and if we confess Him as Savior and Lord, we can be forgiven and saved. You understand that? So this is the gospel. When people tell you other things, well, baptism is a part of the gospel, or, or even repentance. Repentance is important, by the way. When you trust in Christ, there should be repentance. There should be a change of heart and a change of mind. But understand what the gospel is. It's Christ and His sacrificial death on the cross, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, they barely even talk about the death of Christ. They're always talking about His resurrection, right? Because if there's a resurrection, there has to be a death. And so it's important that you and I understand this. Why is this so important? This is where God's wrath, God's justice, and God's mercy meet at the cross, don't they? At the cross, you see the dear Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, executed on the cross suffering the wrath of God on the cross. Why? Was he a bad man? No. He's innocent. He's dying for others. He's dying a substitutionary death. And you see the wrath of God being poured out. At the same time, you see the love of God by Jesus himself, God Almighty in the flesh, dying for others. Justifying others. And so, beloved, you see both the love and the wrath of God coming together at the cross. And now, Paul says, we see the righteousness of God. This is not intrinsic righteousness this is imputed righteousness you understand that I'll explain that in a little bit more so we see then the gospel is a message of the substitutionary death of Christ his burial and his resurrection that's why whenever you share the gospel with somebody it's it's good that you share the death of Christ and the sacrifice but don't forget the resurrection don't leave them in the grave Right? Don't leave him on the cross. Don't leave him in the grave. Christ has risen in power, declaring himself as the Son of the living God. Go with me to Luke chapter 24. Isn't this what Jesus calls his disciples to preach? It is. Luke chapter 24. Go with me there. Luke chapter 24. Remember when Jesus appears to his disciples? 2444. After he had eaten, remember? Because they couldn't believe it. They thought they were seeing a phantom or a ghost. And he says, you have any food here? Give me some food. I want you to touch me. I'm flesh and bones. He had his glorified body, right? His heavenly body. And then he says, it says in verse 43, he took it and he ate. This was some fish. Verse 44, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. They all talk about a coming Messiah. And through the prophets, a suffering. Verse 
Savior. Verse 45, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would what? Suffer, and what else? Rise again from the dead the third day. Now, it doesn't just stop with that, but we're to do something with that, right? Look at verse 47. And here's our part, right? And the disciples' part. And that repentance, see that? For forgiveness of sins would be, see the word proclaim, it means to be preached. That repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed or preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So you see, we're to do something with the gospel. Not only, not only are we to accept it and believe it and treasure it, Christ our Savior, who died for us, who was buried and rose again, we need to now repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and turn to the living God, trusting in Christ by faith, right? And we're to preach it to others. That's how a person gets saved, right? Now, so people need to hear the gospel. They need to understand the good news, what Christ has done for them. And as you know, before we share the good news, we share the bad news. Here's the bad news. We're all sinners. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every man deserves God's judgment. Every man is condemned. Why? What did we do? Well, our great-great-grandpappy, Adam, represented us and he sinned against God. And because of that, sin came into the world because of his disobedience. And now every man is born with a precondition. What is that precondition? Sinfulness. Just see little children. Just watch little children fight. Right? I see little kids fight like men. Wow, look at these guys. They fight over toys and candy. I mean, that's their treasures, right? You give a kid toy and candy, that's like gold. You might as well give them a million dollars. Right? And they fight and they're selfish. Who taught them that? I thought they were a blank slate. That's not what the Bible teaches, right? Psychologists will teach you that. Or they'll say deep down they're really good. The Bible doesn't say that. We believe in the total depravity of man. Man needs deliverance. He needs salvation. So that's the bad news. And because of man's sin, he deserves God's wrath. God's judgment. That's why we needed a Savior, beloved. And so the gospel is about the Savior who's come down from heaven, who came and died for sinners, was buried and resurrected, and, 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 uh, and now is at the right hand of the Father, and now by trusting in Christ as our Savior, as our Lord, we can be forgiven, we can be saved. And so we call people to repentance. It is the power of God, isn't it? And so we see here then that, that it's in contrast to the law. Go with me back to Romans. It's in contrast to the law because that's the fallacy back then, right? Read the, if you ever read the Sermon on the Mount, he's contrasting the false teachings of the rabbis over and over again. And in fact, he tells them, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, you're not going to make it. Because their righteousness was all external. It was, and it wasn't through God's grace and faith. It was, they thought they can earn their own righteousness. Romans 3.10. What does it say there? Romans chapter 3. Got to get there myself. Verse 10 says, As it is written, by the way, this is, this is the natural man. Right? As it is written, there are some righteous, just some. Is that what it says? Not one. It's a big goose egg. Not one. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. Well, who is God talking about? Every man. This is every man. Every woman, right? I'm using that in a general sense. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. 
There is not even one. Wait a minute. I have a neighbor and he's of a different religion. He does good things. Will that save him? No. He comes from a good family. Will that save him? No. He goes to church. Will that save him? No. Only Christ will save you. Only Christ. And so we see here then, when it comes to the natural man, there's no one righteous. Not even one. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of ass or snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So what's the problem? Man is sinful to the core. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Even though man doesn't realize it, he still has to give an account to the Lord. Whether you know the law or not, whether you're ignorant of the law or not, you're going to give an account. Now listen to verse 20. Here's the problem. Because by the works of the law, what does he say? No flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law cannot cleanse you. With the law, we, we begin to see the righteousness of God through the law. And when we see the law, it makes us... It makes us, um, in a sense, it, it makes us shudder, but we learn through Galatians, the law is like a tutor, isn't it? Like a schoolmaster. The law leads us to a certain direction. When you read the law and you realize how sinful you are, the first thing you should think about is, how do I get saved? I need a savior because I can't save myself. The Bible says in the book of Romans that Jesus Christ is the end of the law. What that means is he is the goal of the law. The law is like the tutor or the, or the, um, he's like the, the, the teacher that leads us to the Savior. That's why Jesus, when he shares with others, he tells them, what does the law say? Because with the law is the knowledge of sin, not the forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of sin is only by God's grace through faith in Christ. And so we see here then that what Paul is doing is he's contrasting. He's not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God, not the law. Not the law. And so we are to confess Christ with our mouth as Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. So the righteousness that Paul is mentioning there in Romans is not uh, the righteousness is imputed righteousness. What do I mean by that? Imputed. The word imputed means to put into someone's account, right? So it's like, almost like crediting somebody in a sense. We learn that Abraham believed God and God, uh, he, he took that faith of Abraham and he saw that as righteousness. He imputed righteousness to Abraham. Okay. And so what happens then when a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ, once a person hears what Christ has done for them on the cross, how he suffered and bled and died, and by Christ's death on the cross, he satisfies God's justice on the cross. And by faith, as you trust in Christ, what happens? An exchange happens, right? Your sins are nailed to the cross. And the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you. In a sense, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Do we deserve it? No, we're sinners. So that's the righteousness that Paul is talking about. In it, the righteousness of God is displayed. It's imputed righteousness. It's really, it's Christ's righteousness, isn't it? Go with me to Romans 10, we just mentioned this, but I want you to see this. Here's the problem that, um, that we even face today with false religion, isn't it? Verse 
Paul, who himself is a, um, a son of Abraham, who himself is of the tribe of Benjamin, an Israelite, his heart is broken, just like some of your hearts are broken for your unsafe family. Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is their salvation. He's talking about the nation of Israel. I testify about them that they have what? They have a zeal for God. They seem to be on fire for God. But not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for not knowing about God's righteousness. See, there's a difference. There's God's righteousness. And if we can use this, there's man's righteousness, which is earthly. Not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. See that? That's man-made religion. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. How does one subject himself to the righteousness of God? By faith. By trusting in Christ as Savior and as Lord. Christ who died uh, on the cross for sinners and was buried and rose again. It's by faith. So they were not willing to subject themselves to that because to them it was a stumbling block. To the Greeks it was foolishness. Verse 4, for Christ is what? The end, or I think the, uh, the better translation, is the goal of the law. It points sinners to Christ. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's amazing, and you know, it just, it just strikes right at the heart of man's pride, doesn't it? Remember the rich young ruler? He says, uh, he says, good teacher, what one thing must I do? Remember that? Again, thinking about his own self-righteousness, thinking about something he can earn, he can do, rather than just surrendering, confessing, trusting, repenting. And, uh, and Jesus tells him, you have a false god in your life. And what was that false god? It was riches. Not only riches, it was self-righteousness. Because when Jesus says, what does the law say? Jesus began to share the second part of the Decalogue, right? Honor your mother and father, you know, do not covet. And what did the rich young ruler say? What he should have said is, Lord, have mercy on me. I've broken all of those. You know what he said? I've kept them all. I'm like, really? There was self-righteousness in that man. He thought he was good enough to go to heaven. When he wasn't seeing himself, he was not seeing the deficit there. But on top of that, Jesus goes for the jugular, right? You have a false God. You can't serve two masters. You got to get rid of that God. And that God is riches. Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. Oh, the guy walked away. How did he walk away? Sad. He was willing to hold on to the temporal and let go of the eternal. He would have had so much more. We can only hope that he turned. Some believe it was John Mark. We don't know. When I go to heaven, I'll ask the Lord. And so we see here then, the going back to, to Romans 1, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Don't even accuse me of that. Don't even think that. It is the power of God when it comes to salvation, right? To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and we know that the gospel was first brought to the Jews. And yet the nation itself, even though there are few men that did trust in Christ, the nation of Israel did not trust in Christ as their Messiah. They will, by the way, but when he first came, they didn't. Verse 17 for in it, in the gospel, right, the righteousness of God is revealed. And that righteousness is imputed righteousness. It's not one that's earned. You can't earn. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't, you're not going to go to heaven and say, oh man, I worked so hard for this. To go to heaven. Really? 
When it comes to God's forgiveness and God's mercy, you can't earn it. Remember what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by what? For by faith you are saved through grace. I mean, think about that word order, okay? It says, for by grace you are saved through faith. You know where salvation begins? It begins with God's sovereign grace. That's where it begins. It begins with God's sovereign grace. God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So by grace, you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And so, beloved, you can't earn it. You know why you can't earn it? Because the blood of Christ is priceless. When a person says, oh, I, I think I'm, I'm good, I'm, I go to church, I do all these things, they're putting their good works to be equal with the blood of Christ. And I tell them, you're false. That's a false teaching. What can equal the blood of Christ? Nothing. It's priceless. It can only be a, a, a gift that can be received by faith. It is the power of God, isn't it? And now he gets into, go back with me to Romans, he gets into practice. So he says here then, in verse 17, for in it, talking about the gospel, it is the righteousness of God, uh, excuse me, the righteousness of God is revealed. And listen to this, this is interesting. Because, boy, I'll tell you, uh, a lot of different commentaries, a lot of different things. It says, from faith to faith, it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And I remember going over that and reading different commentaries, like, what does that mean? And I looked at the original languages. And you have the word ek, when it says from faith, it's ek pistos to ace Pistin, from faith to faith. One has to do with origin and the other one has to do with continuation. One has to do with justification. The other one has to do with sanctification. And so we learn that when it comes to, to receiving the gospel, it begins by faith, doesn't it? Of course, by God's grace through faith. So it starts off out of faith. That's the source in the sense in verse 17, from faith or from out of faith, because that's the word ek. Whenever you hear the word ek in the Greek, it means out of. So when someone shares the gospel with you, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ, right? And then there's faith. As God opens your heart, it begins by faith. There's, there's the justification, the Lord uh, saves you. And not only does it start with faith, but it continues in faith. That's what it's saying when it comes to the gospel. From faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And in other words, we're saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. And... We see that, and it's like, okay, that's how a person is justified. What about the way we live? How should we live? We continue to live by God's grace through faith in Christ. You understand? It's a continuous thing. It isn't like, okay, um, I'm, I'm saved, and I put my trust in Jesus, and, you know, and that's now in the past, and now I can go do whatever I want to do. No. The righteous man will live by faith. He will continually believe. Go with me to um, Colossians 2. I want you to see this. And uh, we got to wrap this up and get into the Lord's table here. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 3 to 10, I thought this was a very interesting thing that Paul wrote to them. Talking to them about the superiority of Christ, how they need to worship Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, we learn that in this passage, there are a lot of people that are trying to fool these, these, uh, these young Christians into following a false religion and... and, and uh, and even follow the law, or even worshiping angels. And Paul says, you know what? When it comes to Christ and you have trusted Christ, you are complete in Christ. It's like the days in the 90s. Remember, people were getting into Christian psychology. And they'll tell you, you know what? To trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord is not enough. And reading your Bible and going, that's not enough. You need to go see a psychologist. Like they had all the answers 
Like, no, I don't think so. We are complete in Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Regarding Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, I say, I say this so that no one will delude you with what? Persuasive argument? For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, this is really important. Look at verse 6. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Let me ask you, how did you receive Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Was it by your works? Was it by your flesh? No, it was by faith. It was by God's grace through faith. And so Paul says, if that's how you receive Christ, by God's grace through faith, look at the second part of verse 6. That's how you, you are to walk. By God's grace through faith. If you receive the Lord by God's grace through faith, that's how you are to walk the rest of your life. Now, we are only saved once, but we continually are exercising faith. We are to walk in obedience, trusting in the Lord, seeking His grace, walking by faith. That's how we walk. Just as we receive the Lord, that's how we walk. Like little children, right? We're to be like little children when we receive the gospel message and believe with all our heart. That's how we're to live our lives. We receive Christ by faith. We are to walk by faith. And as Paul puts it, from faith to faith. Why? Because the righteous man lives by faith. And when you live by faith, that means you're living a life of obedience. A life of obedience. So much more here to say. Um, and you see that um, in this passage, you see that, that uh, when it comes to um, uh, God's righteousness, again, it's imputed. And, uh, and uh, we are to, as we receive the Lord by faith, we're to walk in faith. Uh, and, and if you remember that, um, that uh, in the scripture, Jesus gives us the parable. Remember the parable of the, the tax collector and the, and the Pharisee? Uh, you see, um, the, the righteousness of God is the, the complete opposite of the righteousness of man. And you see that picture with that, that, that Pharisee who is trusting in himself. A man who is saved by God's grace through faith in Christ is one who continues to live by God's grace through faith in Christ. So let me ask you, how do you live your life? Do you walk by faith? Do you seek the Lord on a daily basis? I don't know about you, but I need God's grace on a daily basis, right? Not to save me again, because I'm saved. You're, when you're saved, you're saved once for all. Let me just close with this before we have the men come forward. Remember what Ephesians 2 8, 9 says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You have to understand that forgiveness cannot be earned. God's mercy cannot be earned. It has to be given. Right? Can you imagine someone coming up to you, and maybe you've seen this, where like, oh, you have to forgive me. Or you have to have mercy on me. Like, I don't think so. Though, you know, in Scripture it says we have to do that. We have to obey the Lord. But can't imagine someone demanding for you to forgive them. It's like, no, it's supposed to be a gift. It's supposed to be, you know, from that, that person's heart. And so when it, when it says here, when it says uh, salvation, it says we are saved, uh, for by grace we are saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And as I mentioned earlier, notice it doesn't say, for by faith we are saved through grace. Because it doesn't start with man. It starts with God. Again, it begins with the sovereign grace of God. So let me ask you, have you received the forgiveness of God? Are you sure that if you die today, that you would be with the Lord forever? Are you saved? Only those people who have repented and trusted in Christ as their Savior and Lord will be saved. Have you done that? Have you called to the Lord and asked Him to save you? Remember that Christ came into this world to save, to deliver, to rescue who? Righteous people? 
Are religious people? No, sinners. That's what we are. And, we're, and, and Christ came to deliver sinners from what? I remember this guy asked me, and I was at, working at Sears when I was going to college. He says, um, people are talking to me about Jesus, and, about, and he says, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And then I was talking to my friends, and they asked him, what are you saved from? And he couldn't answer. He's like, I don't know. And a lot of people say, oh, I'm saved from my sin. No, you're saved from the wrath of God. You understand that? As a result of your sin. Christ Jesus came into this world to deliver, to save, to rescue sinners from the wrath of God, from eternal hell, from the lake of fire. This is why Christ came and suffered and died, right? To deliver sinners. This is why he died a substitutionary death. And three days later, Christ rose again, declaring himself again as a son of God. So let me ask you, have you confessed publicly? Have you confessed publicly Jesus as Savior and Lord? Do you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? That's what we need to do, don't we? Well, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have the men come forward. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the gospel message that's all about Christ and him crucified, buried, and resurrected. And now, Father, because, because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, where he paid the penalty, where he took upon himself the wrath of God, we can be forgiven by faith in Christ alone. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. And thank you for not giving us what we deserve. And thank you, Father, for clothing us in the righteousness of Christ that we don't deserve. We ask now for your grace as we prepare our hearts uh, for the cup and uh, for the bread. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'm going to turn over.